Hey y'all, Andrew here with Free Tours by Foot New Orleans. Today I'm going to take you on a walk along Magazine Street. This is famous as being New Orleans' main strip for shopping, as well as a lot of restaurants, some bars, antique stores, art galleries, and it's had all that stuff for like a century and a half. So it's all in this setting of classic old buildings and also just this old neighborhood market atmosphere from back when you needed to have all the basic staples of life within walking distance. This one's gonna be high quality video and audio. So this is one for your headphones and for a large screen if you've got it. And we don't usually get to do this on our regular day-to-day -day walking tours. So I'm really excited to share with you Something a little different, some people watching, some cool old buildings, and just hanging out in a great neighborhood. Some ideas for if you ever end up traveling here yourself. So we have these in lots of other places, New Orleans and other cities. If you have other places you'd like to do some walking through, take a look at our channels. You might find them. If you've got ones you'd like to see but they're not there, let us know and it might be in the pipeline soon. And if you would like to tip your guide, you'll find the information to do that down below. Here we go. We begin, just so you absolutely know where you are, with a place offering alligator eyes for sale. <laughs> what does that mean? I'm not sure, but it's the name of the store. Lots of new places on Magazine Street right now. All of this is early 20th century to mid 20th century houses turned businesses. There's a lot of that on this street. We've got district, Coffee and donuts across the way. Definitely one worthwhile spot. And that dirty coast next to it. Good place to go home from with a clever t-shirt. And I think nothing really grabs Magazine Street quite like this Whole Foods located in a National Historic Landmark. This is an old street barn. So Magazine Street used to have, in lieu of all the cars running up and down it now, a couple of streetcar tracks going in either direction. And you can see by way of commemoration of that, a little monument here. So this was converted back early in the 2000s, not that long ago, and has been a Whole Foods ever since. And basically like businesses of a lot of different kinds built into very historic building stock. It's kind of what Magazine Street is all about. We're actually at the relatively young end of it. Oh, and you can see where so the streetcars come out onto the street right here. This was the end of the line. Maybe you can tell the street zigzags a tiny bit there. So this is the younger end. As I mentioned, we're starting uptown, working our way downtown, which basically means going back in time. And up here, a lot of what you see is going to be 20th century stuff. With the vibe changed a lot. So St. Joe's Bar over there used to be Miss May's, a much divier place than it is today. Hazelnut there home goods store owned by Brian Batt, actor you may know. And so these businesses all came up around providing for the essential needs of the residents of the neighborhood. And it is just residences on either side of this. So Magazine Street, very much your shopping and dining corridor today, but usually about optional things today rather than the critical things of day-to-day -day life. Not without exception, one does need toys. And actually, the guy we've got here, so this innocuous building is a former market building. And if you think of the French market in the French Quarter, maybe you can picture it if you've seen that before music store across the way, also crucial to survival. So the French market, as you may know, open air environment with lots of little individual sellers 
and the commercial portions of the magazine grew up around several of those. I am highlighting this building because up across the top, not where it says Hong Bank, but right below that, it says Ewing Market Branch. And that building back there was the Ewing Market. So there were all these little publicly owned market buildings, four of them on magazine. And you would gather there for your day-to-day -day essentials and lots of other buildings would grow up around it. Residences in some parts, businesses in others. And so today, as you explore this street, it's alternating pockets of business, residential, business, residential, corresponding with where those old markets were, even though all you have left today is the buildings, which have all been turned into other commercial purposes. In this part, the oldest housing you're going to find is this kind of late 19th century, early 20th century Queen Anne stuff. Although some of the institutions are older. We're crossing Jefferson Avenue up here. It's the one thing, the old name of the community. This part of town that you're in used to be a place called Jefferson City. Park tour. Not a bad idea. Wink, wink. So, as we're passing now, the Poydras home. You can see that since 1817 on there. In 1817, this was in a different place, and it was a different building, and it served a different purpose. So, was it the same thing? You decide. But the Poydras home in 1817 was an orphanage of that name, founded by a guy, Julian Poydras, who's a big philanthropist in the region. And it eventually moved up here and eventually became an old folks home. But some older things here and there. Y'all can maybe make out the decorations across the way. So as you possibly know, it's 2021. We had to get real innovative this Mardi Gras. And we decorated houses much more than we normally do. And while mostly those decorations, we called them house floats, have been taken down by now. There are some nice vestiges, some festive leftovers gradually aging, and you can see a bit of it above too. Some beads on the power lines up there. That's all the time actually, so mostly the parade route for Mardi Gras is on St. Charles Avenue, but some of them I say a little less than half of them roll on this part of Magazine Street. And so, among the locals, if you live along this stretch, you're in very high demand for hosting that time of year. Whether hosting means an out of towner overnight, or sometimes maybe means <laughs> an acquaintance who just needs to borrow the bathroom. And uh, having lived on this stretch of Magazine Street at one time, I can say one finds oneself having a lot more friends than one remembered at that time of the year. Guys, po' boys across the way. Looks like a cafeteria on the inside. And you should be suspicious of any po' boy joint that doesn't. This is fun too, when you get to know the neighborhood. These no parking signs. At a glimpse, it seems like they probably mean all year long. But once you read them, it means no parking on parade days, which is a very small number of days throughout the year, but those signs are there all the time. The New Orleans Fine Arts Academy, New Orleans Academy of Fine Arts, set it out of order. This is also a, a home that predates a lot of what was around here and a couple of little what we call shotgun houses repurposed to the needs of an art school. Plenty of shotgun houses serving the residential purpose still today. 
often but not always with our signature bright colors. Besides guys, if you find yourself up here, the alternative po'boy joint is just down the way over here, a little place called Domelisi's. They each have their own specialties, so it depends which kind of po'boy you want, which is the wisest to visit. It's a bit of a surreal experience walking down magazine right now because so many things, like the hair joint we just passed, are brand new. It being spring of 2021, first day of April actually, as I record this, I promise I'm telling you the truth about everything. No April Fools's, or maybe I'll sneak one in somewhere. But seriously, it's been a very tough year for retail, among other things. Lots of retail and service businesses along this stretch. And so we've seen a great many places close for good. And in some cases, new ones spring up in their wake, though plenty of them were not quite there yet, so we're going to be seeing some empty buildings as we go. Here's one, not actually a COVID casualty. This one, the owner died a while earlier. This was T. Eva's Pralines. And T. Eva was just one of the most badass people you could meet very elderly woman, ran this praline shop for decades, was, uh, was a baby doll, so a New Orleans street masking tradition. I got to go to her birthday party one time. Most New Orleans single event I have ever seen in my life. And after she passed away, the family decided to close the shop. She was an institution and definitely a vestige of the kind of little locally owned and operated mom and pop kind of businesses that used to be the staple on the street. The school we're passing now says Xavier University Preparatory School. There is a much more complex history here than that. This is actually today a high school called St. Catherine Drexel. But another building standing on this site was the original home of Southern University, one of the historically black colleges and universities in our state, which then moved to Baton Rouge. And then the building got used by Xavier University, also a historically black college, or university in this case, which moved within New Orleans. And then it became Xavier Prep. So it has been four different institutions largely serving young black folks. Henry's Uptown Bar. This is the oldest business on Magazine Street that is still in the building where it started. It goes back to 1900. And that is the kind of little palace of grunge you would have seen all up and down this street for a long time. Some of those still left over. You got some great dive bars. And that is a, a building made of what we call barge board. Us being at the bottom of the Mississippi. When people arrived down at the bottom of the river, talking the days of steamboats and before, oftentimes you were on vessels that had no propulsion other than the river itself. And so they just sold the boat when they got down here. And the result was that it was all this surplus wood and it got used to build houses. Another one of the surviving old 19th century, I'm gonna call that a mansion. I'll give it that. I think it's got the square footage. Here's another one of our empty ones. Waiting for the next thing to come along. Next door, should you end up in this part of town, 
Pizza Domenica. One of the better happy hours you're going to find around. Super affordable, very good pizza, so... Plenty of people make the very reasonable decision not to eat things like pizza when they're in New Orleans, which is known for its own culinary specialties. But we can do the stuff other people came up with pretty well, too. This residence has turned businesses atmosphere, so we are out of the first commercial district, the area that sprang up around the Ewing Market. And so you're seeing what would once have been all residences, nowadays largely converted. But it's still has a really different feel from once we get down to the next market district, which is pretty soon. Y'all might be noticing the bus stop signs. So there is not a streetcar here anymore. The streetcar rails were torn out on Magazine Street for the most part back in the 1940s. That is an Airbnb. You know from those licenses in the windows. Plus the pristineness of the paint job is a little suspicious. So when the streetcar rails came out, they didn't replace it with a bus right away. They replaced it with this kind of halfway point, these bus tram combos that were still electrically powered but on wheels so they didn't need the rails anymore they just still had electric propulsion from above like our streetcars on st charles avenue do today And to celebrate that, the business owners associations on Magazine Street organized a parade. And y'all know we love a parade. But this one was themed around the evolution of public transit in New Orleans, which doesn't sound like the, the most aesthetically pleasing possible concept, but they did pretty well with it. We started on Magazine in 1835 with horse-drawn streetcars. Mule-drawn, probably. <laughs> Surrey's across the street. There are two locations of this place on Magazine Street. One of the things folks end up looking real hard for in New Orleans is a good breakfast spot. And Surrey's is up there. A lot of American breakfast. A little bit of a Latin edge. Man, this spot. Le Bonton Roulet. The French may not make any sense, but this is a neighborhood bar, real deal. Some Israeli cuisine over here. And Le Bonton is also the place where the Soul Rebels, one of our great New Orleans brass bands with a heap and helping of R&B and hip hop to their repertoire do a weekly show on Thursdays whenever they aren't traveling. So really worthwhile place to have on your radar. Apolline, upscale restaurant there, but they've got the pretty cool idea of doing cocktail fittings. So you can go in for a fee, of course, and get interviewed by one of their bartenders and they will figure out what your tastes are and customize a drink for you and keep it on the menu in sort of a Rolodex of drinking regulars pretty much indefinitely. 
most valuable if you're going to be there frequently. But hey, if you're watching this about to move to New Orleans, quick, easy way to make your mark. The street we're passing up here is called Balance. And this is the street that our famous musicians, the Neville Brothers, grew up on. So you would, perhaps if you are a big funk fan, have heard a song called Balance Street by them. As y'all can kind of see by the types of businesses located here, this part of magazine is a lot less touristic. This is maybe about as much of the old magazine street as you'd be able to experience today. It's very much the needs of people who are here now. Auto shops and, <laughs> well, bead shops. Beads are, again, survival critical a lot of the things we do here, like making Mardi Gras Indian suits. Also, surprisingly tough town in which to find French cuisine, but bakeries we do better than average. La Boulangerie right here. As you can go uptown for, uh, hello there in the window. Let's just say all kinds of pastries, French and otherwise. We're getting to the first of our art galleries. If y'all saw the French Quarter walkthrough we did. I've seen the gallery down there of Chris Roberts Antio, our tapestry artist. She's got the two locations here and then some others outside of New Orleans. Speaking of dive bars, Brothers Three. I don't think I have to elaborate. It's another one across the way. Several places in town that share the Igor's name, that red building up ahead. And they mostly combine bar and grill and laundromat functions under the same roof. Some places you can sweeten the laundromat with Wi-Fi. In New Orleans, you add alcohol. Normally, you don't highlight the physical therapists on the block, but y'all, a legit miracle was done to me there. <laughs> I had a whole set of muscles in my body not working. And the dude just twisted my neck a little bit and it all came back online. And I was a convert to physical therapy from then on. Pass a few sushi joints. So, last of the beads in the trees, at least, the last of the ones put there organically by parade activity. Because right up here at Napoleon Avenue, stoplight up ahead, this is where Mardi Gras parades turn. So typically, if a parade begins on magazine at all, it's rolling right here to the end of the block, and then it's hanging a left. And this Median, this is neutral ground, as we would say, over here, be absolutely full of people. Others of them start down that way. And 
where this street, Napoleon Avenue, meets our beautifully named Chapatulis Street, right next to Tipitina's Music Club. And you get some post Mardi Gras parade shows there that are about as good as it gets. Speaking of bars, we got not with music. Miss Mays over here, a place that took advantage of quarantine closure to make a big redo happen. This is a uh, very, I think maybe like their first repaint job in 50 years. Don't quote me on that number, but it certainly looked like it. If y'all can hear the bells tolling. Love these. Lots of the time, you can still see a sign in the street or around the door of what used to be there. Casamentos. So, if you want to find classic local institutions, this is a I, I want to call it an oyster restaurant. That's the majority of what it does. Many permutations on oysters, including our local char-grilled oyster signature in a heavily tiled space. Real, real casual, but there's a line out the door when they're open. Peaches Record Store. And this building, the tell of what it used to be is on the inside. There's a whole Woolworth's lunch counter in there. So this used to be a Woolworth's. And they've still got a lot of the fixtures. Now our bilingual school in this part of town, French Immersion Program, is expanding its facility right now. They do a Fête Française, French festival, a cultural festival. It goes on right around the corner from here every year. And we also have St. George's Episcopal School in, check it out up there on top, Jefferson Market from 1917. Don't know if you can tell, but the decorative images on either side are bull skulls. So the Jefferson Market was the second of our markets that the commercial districts grew up around. And this one is now a school gym. So we have one that's a shop, we have one that's a gym, and we'll see others serving still more functions. La Petite Grocery here is not a grocery store. It used to be, and that's their way of commemorating what they used to be. It is a very good restaurant. Modern Creole, let's call it. Grocery stores are sadly one of the things that's kind of hard to come by on the street these days. When they exist, they are generally Whole Foods types. Quite a few Vietnamese restaurants in the neighborhood. Magazine Kitchen over there. Red Gravy, a downtown institution. Just keep showing y'all my reflection. And our second costume shop of the walk, Miss Claudia's. Which, you know, you might end up here quite easily on a holiday without knowing it. And having access to a costume shop somewhere handy, really handy for those special days. Glass art, a big part of our visual art community here. Tulane University Uptown has a noted glass program graduates of quite a few people who stay around. 
even our chains here, like Buffalo Exchange, are going to filter local culture in some way. So, find some pretty great costume or sort of strange vintage material in there, too. Because, of course, the people dropping stuff off to be resold have those things in the first place. just past the heart of the second market district. Now, most of what visitors are going to be spending their time in is the third and fourth ones, because they are closer to the French Quarter. So the best, or maybe just the most familiar, is yet to come. This is a bit dated, but the antiques business has been a pretty big part of Magazine Street's life. Less of a thing, just as that field has contracted in general, but you still find some great ones. Mostly further up ahead of us. Especially in the last of the four, you get some cool, quirky stuff up there. No wizard across the way. This is a uh, locally founded business. Part of a sort of <laughs> local empire. Snow gulls, as we call them, often called snow cones. Other places are in very high demand here the right time of the year. And uh, Snow Wizard came up with the way to shave ice instead of crushing it. And you can buy in on their equipment and open a Snow Wizard in your own neighborhood. Hmm. Pop-up means temporary. I don't know quite what to make of that. the old places moving out to the suburbs. Here's one of our galleries. Alex Beard here. Used to visit his gallery all the time in the French Quarter. No worries, y'all. His thing is... Street. We're passing through a series of streets here named for European place names, specifically places where Napoleon fought battles. There's a Milan Street, although people here say Milan. There's a Marengo Street, and there used to be a Berlin Street. But around World War I, we had a sort of moment, maybe you remember Freedom Fries, when France wasn't into being a part of the Iraq War. Uh, we did that with German things in the early 20th century here, as a great many places in America did. And so Berlin Street got changed to General Pershing. So Napoleon Avenue, followed by a menu of Napoleon's victories. Somehow, when Freedom Fries happened, we did not change those. Fuck out, Lee. 
second of our Vietnamese restaurants. This is my neighborhood one. And I can very much compliment it. New place moving in across the way. And store for Mignon Fege, who is local jewelry designer with lots of uh, Louisiana flora and fauna in her designs. <laughs> so shawarma on the go. I also think this grabs onto what magazine is all about pretty nicely. So this is a gas station with a great little shawarma joint in it. And maybe not the food you associate with New Orleans, but magazine for a long time was a dividing line between on the left, the relatively well-to-do, the what's not men's words, the very well-to-do homes of people who had usually recently arrived from further up in the United States in the decades following the Louisiana Purchase. Mainly that story goes to downtown and the Garden District. But it applies pretty much everywhere. And to the right was a mixed immigrant neighborhood. Depending on who says these words, the boundaries that they intend are really different, but you can call the area over to the right of us the Irish Channel. We're not to the kind of technical Irish Channel yet, but the atmosphere is really similar all around. And the Irish Channel was, like the name suggests, pretty Irish, but also pretty German and also pretty Italian. And so you had all of these immigrant-owned businesses doing a mix of local food and their own signature cuisine. Hence Casamento's back there. And there was a time when at least all of the older people who own businesses here, you'd have heard some kind of non-American accent on them. Roulette, very good French food over across the street. So for us today, basically, to have an immigrant-owned shawarma restaurant built into a gas station, well, that combination of serving the necessities of day-to-day -day life and also it being an immigrant-owned business, raising kids whose voices sound very different from their parents, that is a classic magazine street story. WRBH up here. This is a radio station serving the blind. And so volunteers here will read the news, the print news, to make sure that blind folks in the area still have full access to it. And they have the only little free library that I've ever seen with Braille on it. And Braille in it one assumes. Fundamentals of day-to-day -day life, including hardware store and corset shop. Across the way, we have one of three different shoe repair spots in the neighborhood. Oddly, they group together, it seems like. And we also have Imperial Woodpecker Snowball Stand. Mentioned snowball businesses are everywhere. And 
while they are in very high demand for part of the year, they are in very low demand the other part of the year. So there's a problem with that business model. And so they've had the very clever idea of becoming a soup stand in the winter. Sell something cool when it's hot, sell something hot when it's cool. Hmm. Y'all, this, see all these little buds? That is jasmine. That is about to burst open. And the neighborhood is about to smell sweet and cloying and perfumed. Mahoney's po' boy shop. Howdy. Y'all, they know you. You've got fans. Some Mardi Gras leftovers. Slash perfectly appropriate Easter decorations. All right, y'all. Now we are coming upon the third market district. And I think this is probably the most happening of them. I think it is today. It definitely is objectively most of the time. This is the one that borders the Garden District, so very high demand space, lots of foot traffic. So tons of restaurants up through here, and probably on a first trip to town, this is the part you're likeliest to see. Pardon me. We're also going steadily further back in time, so this stretch is a funny mix of higher turnover because it is very high demand and therefore it's pretty high rent, but also some real classic stuff in there too. So, you know, here's a poke restaurant that has been there in a couple years. But then just down of it is a no works with a very faded sign and a body shop that is uh, better about keeping its colors sharp but still has paid its dues, let's say. Having crossed oh. Louisiana Avenue, y'all, we got Boyle Seafood House over here. This is a relative newcomer, but one to keep an eye on. They are one of the few restaurants you'll find doing some of the Louisiana-Vietnamese fusion that is kind of one of the new waves for us. Like Viet Cajun crawfish. That dog does sausages of all kinds with all kinds of things on them. couple real classic businesses across the way. Speaking to the older side of this, Vargas Body Shop over there, and New Orleans Millworks, making doors and whatnot, Magazine Pawn Shop, all right here in a row, and at the end of the block, Big Fisherman Seafood. And y'all, if you want just some straight up boiled crawfish, this time of the year, springtime, but you are bristling at what they charge for it in some places, some restaurants. Do what we do. Get it from one of these places. Well, you know, you could do it yourself, but get it from one of these places, lay it out on a pile of newspaper, and get it in a backyard somewhere. Bromart, one of the surviving grocery stores, regionally owned in the area. And you can maybe see the spelling of bro, that E-A-U-X. Very French, very Cajun. And if you spend enough time in Louisiana, you will see a not French nor Cajun word of some kind spelled with an E-A-U-X. What up? They love you. Y'all's friends are everywhere out here. This is the Bulldog, 
all those young folks are on their way to get shocker shockers beer what's up fam how we doing cheers, cheers. But yeah um <laughs> if you see enough saints paraphernalia the local football team you will see the phrase go saints spelled g-e-a-u-x at some point Walgreens, uh, <laughs> not, not for nothing am I pointing that out, but Basin Seafood and Spirits, another good oyster destination, and then some. But this Walgreens stands where there used to be a stables for the mules that once pulled the streetcars. So that is a facility that we did not keep. Balcony Bar, another one for your dive bar itinerary. One dollar off. One dollar wells and drafts. One dollar off. Like, not even the dive bars today. And here we have our third market building. So this is the old 9th Street Market. Still see that on the sign above it. And of the businesses located here today, Allow me to highlight, bottom right, Levy Baking Company. The entrance to which is right over there. You are welcome. Rum House, Kirby and Taqueria. Pretty excellent. This is walking distance from a Garden District tour. Funky Monkey, gonna go home with a little bit of vintage, etc. Haydell's over here is a uh, local renowned bakery from another part of the city but that a lot of people swear by for king cake and they do some kind of permutation on king cake just about every time of year and red dog diner is a cool one currently closed but one of the really cool things about these mid to late 19th century buildings that you find all along here is in the vein of traditional new orleans architecture they have courtyards so courtyard dining big part of the scene in the French Quarter. There's a good many places up here that do it too, including Red Dog Diner. The Rendezvous, let's call it Le Rendezvous. Another one of your dive bar options. So many. Oh, <laughs> so this truck, y'all, you see the logo on them for Ralts. And the shop that he's going back to is right across the street. You see H. Ralt over there, also Terrence Osborne next door. Local artist, one of the better known ones. So H. Ralt, their sign says, established 1845, and that is totally true. They are one of the oldest businesses in New Orleans, and they have survived uh, by jumping around. It used to be in the French Quarter, they moved uptown, changed locations a few times, changed what they do. They went from being a gunsmith to a locksmith. And now they sell a bunch of jewelry with like keys and locks featured on them. The noticeable part of this is the cigar shop. But this is a really pretty high-end place to live called the Orphanage. And that is exactly what it used to be. So Another change of purpose. Joey K's, some classic Cajun Creole type stuff. And do note the signs all over there. Lots and lots of signs painted in a similar style, including the cute ones on the door that say Barmacy and Sorry We're Open. We'll find the artist who made those later. Pippin Lane right here is a project of Mary Beth Goodman, the wife of John Goodman, who lives just a few blocks away from here, who live both. French Truck Coffee, one of your better coffee options in town with several locations. And a fire station, which has an appropriately decorated little free library, for one. And is also a polling place. So, if you ever go by 
the fire station and you see a line of people waiting. Either there's an election going on or the sexy fireman calendar has just come out. Can't say for sure which of those two. One more of our legacy businesses. I don't actually know how to say their name. Elsner Brothers over there, Sheet Metal Company. Again, another throwback to a magazine street of a bygone time. Dingier, grungier, and a uh, little bit more for the common man. Versus when this sign today says New Orleans dry goods. Would not expect a classic your grandparents' version of a dry goods store. Sake Cafe, if you're in the market for sushi in town, your better choices. And for just a hot minute, you wouldn't know where you were. Got Chipotle and Starbucks across the street. Notice I said a French truck was one of your better coffee options in the neighborhood. But right across the street from there, Ruby Slipper. Very popular breakfast joint, so well, we saw one earlier. Here's another. Notice lunch and brunch. They're versatile. So this is Washington Avenue. Street running for our purposes over to the left. And that's going to lead right to the heart of the Garden District. So most tours that you take at the Garden District are going to meet right along the street there. If you wanted a really nice meal before or after one of those, croquette right here is going to treat you right. But as you saw back there, lots of other options. So note the Oak Alley say there aren't plenty of those in town, but it does make it a little easier to find. And we now leave the third market area on our way to the fourth one. So we're back in residential territory. And all these little free libraries, they have proliferated. go home with a whole new collection. Those guys did a, uh, <laughs> a reading rainbow themed house play. Those Mardi Gras decorations. That was a pretty cool one. The whole Irish channel, the neighborhood to our right, did TV themed ones. Because when you take a TV theme and you make it about reading, we see what kind of person you are. No, just because we are past the parade route does not mean we will stop seeing beads and shoes. It just means they were put there later. And it does not mean <laughs> okay. <laughs> it was tied down with Christmas lights, y'all. <laughs> oh my god. Okay. Um <laughs> so we are still on parade route. And that is thanks to Tracy's at a 1949 institution here. Kind of the, if you want to have an incarnation of the Irish Channel, this is probably it. We got Tracy's right here. And then right around the corner, a place called Parasols. Haha. Crawfish to go. G E A U X. So Parasols is at the end of the block over there. And Tracy's and Parasols are the epicenter of St. Patrick's Day for us. 
sort of the Irish Channel being predominantly Irish, although with those other cultures I mentioned earlier. St. Patrick's has remained a very big deal in this part of town. And it falls next to a lesser known holiday, yet another themed little free library. Proceed with caution, seems like. Happy Easter. Oh, and that's what the flags say. So, another mid-March holiday is St. Joseph's Day. Not as well known, but a big part of our Italian diaspora community. And St. Joseph's Day, besides entailing some parades, so we have, I want to say, six parades between St. Patrick's Day and St. Joseph's Day, generally. And they involve throwing fresh produce so you can catch a cabbage or a head of garlic or something. It's going to be holidays. These guys are famous for their Halloween display. It is way past Halloween and there are some lingering spiders. But hey, spiders exist every time you go. Anyway, St. Joseph's Day gets some parade stuff, but it also gets altars, St. Joseph's altars, which are these incredible spreads of kind of ornamental food that happen in churches and in homes. Hmm. It's spring, and we got wisteria. Not a ton of it to be seen right now, but at least a little bit. That needs more sun. I don't need to criticize the growing habits of my neighbors. bigger houses across the way, y'all, where you can see we're next to the Garden District and we've got <laughs> things that bear the name, but certainly things that bear the style. The signature of the Garden District is big mansions on a lot that is the size of a full quarter of a block. So we're not quite getting that over here, but a few blocks over to the left, it would be a different story. This is really where you would have this part of the strip. A very rich versus poor contrast on either side of the street. Back in the 19th century to the left was all millionaires. And to the right was fresh off the boat folks. Just making it work. Magazine was kind of the meeting place of both. It was where all the commerce happened, at least between the residents of the Irish Channel and the Garden District residents' servants. But you know, if you were going to be seen by anybody, this was where you were seen. Everybody needed something that came from here, so it just sort of organically became this common bond. And the reason why the neighborhoods were so different on each side is mostly to do with elevation. So to the right is the Mississippi River, which normally would mean the land to the right slopes downhill. But in New Orleans, it means the land to the right slopes uphill. Because as you may know, New Orleans is on alluvial soil, which means all of this under us used to be the Gulf of Mexico. And the deposit of earth from the river, just dropping dirt from everywhere else, slowly extended the land out and out and out. But because of that, it means the river is the highest thing. And that the land quickly drops off into swamps. The swamps were to our left but we long since emptied them out in order to expand the city. So nowadays, you have all built land, all inhabited land to our left, but inhabited land that is below sea level. Not immediately. Um, the area immediately to the left of us, Garden District and thereabouts, is above sea level, but less so than to our right. And you certainly, if you had your choice, wanted to live above sea level, but you didn't necessarily want to be right by the river. 
because that was going to be high traffic, noisy, smelly, all that. And so a little bit of distance was ideal. So really, the area to the right of us is the norm. <laughs> Honestly, from a living perspective, New Orleans is mostly, in the long term, undesirable land. It's either flood prone or it's socially really intense. Yes. The land to the left of us is the sliver that is neither of those things. And even once we leave the Garden District, which we're going to do right up ahead, you get into the lower Garden District, which is very much the same story. So elevation tells you an awful lot about history here. And you know, we saw a district location right back by the top. And here is a district location pretty close to the bottom. This one does coffee, donuts, and sliders. Centric combo, but they make it work. And Stein's Market, besides having some great sandwiches, also has a little window serving what's called whatever coffee, and it is legit just about the best coffee in the neighborhood. Serious coffee snobs staff that place. That take us off of the street for one block, just cause over here, not to be missed, is the headquarters of Simon Altveld. And <laughs> perfect for what we've been discussing. Yes, thank you, Simon. So he is the guy who makes all of these signs, and they are everywhere. And he also made this. So the building you see here was a pretty young one when, actually, uh, so built after Hurricane Katrina. Before that, this was an empty lot. And as you can see, we have the date of Hurricane Katrina right here with Simon's signature underneath that. So the woman this pays homage to, Vera, Vera Smith, died here in a hit and run on the street nearby. And because of just the sheer desolation of New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, her body was untouched for several days. And her neighbors ended up seeing to her care by kind of fashioning a little gravesite around her and covering her. And later, when she was removed, the loss of that tiny born of necessity sacred spot felt like a loss to folks in the neighborhood and they built another one a lasting one on the lot right here not what you see but another one further in and then the lot got bought and turned into a restaurant and the building you see here was constructed and that involved tearing down this little memorial so vera had been displaced twice even though her body was now buried with her family and so, when the restaurant opened, not the restaurant that's here now, but the, the previous one that used the building, the way Simon tells it, <laughs> they, uh, they had a, a, a really unlucky opening and a lot went wrong and things would, would come locked and unlocked. I don't remember all the details, but basically employees started to ask around the neighborhood if something was wrong with the place, i.e. was it haunted? And Simon explained to them the absence of the memorial, and he offered his services to replace it. At this point, we're at Incarnation 4, because the third one was a little fountain, and with the redo of the building fairly recently, that too was done away with, but Simon has stayed around, and he's been able to give the thing every little rebirth that it needed. So, if you want to get that story from the horse's mouth, here's the place. Pretty brilliant little spot to walk through and super easy to miss. And right next to Antiques. Worth coming around the corner here, y'all, both because there's some great old uh, less high traffic 
Greek Revival houses along here, and just classic New Orleans housing of various kinds. Same kind of stuff that you'd see in a lot of the Garden District and its neighbors, and we are right on the corner of it right now, but just in a, a somewhat more unassuming environment. And also, really worth turning the block over here. So, we're coming up on a hub of churches. And near where we're standing now, there used to be a Catholic church patronized mostly by French speakers, of whom there were a modest number in the neighborhood. A little down that way was the Episcopalian church. And then up ahead of us, the way we are eventually going, crosswalks are not a thing we pay attention to here, y'all, so thank you. Right when I say that, the world hears me. So up ahead are two surviving Catholic churches. You can start to see facilities connected with one of them on the right over here. So this building is called Silos Hall, named for Francis Silos, who is in the long and twisty process of possibly becoming a saint, died while serving yellow fever victims, and actually died of yellow fever himself, which was a big killer in New Orleans. And he has a little shrine at St. Mary's Assumption, the church on the right which is a functioning church. And so if you ever look for a place to experience a mass in New Orleans and you're staying over here uptown, this is one of your options. So this is St. Mary's Assumption, kind of an architectural oddity. Hard to categorize. And then on the other side of this street, we have St. Alphonsus, that one right there. And these are across the street from each other, and they were about a block away from the one patronized by French folks. And St. Mary's Assumption was for Germans, and St. Alphonsus was for the Irish folks. So the English-speaking Irish went to one church, the German-speaking Germans went to another one, and the French-speaking French went to another one, all to hear a mass in Latin. At this point, the attending population is not such that there, there's a need for all those different churches, nor are those cultural groups nearly as distinct as they used to be. So St. Mary's is the only one that still serves a congregation of those, the Episcopalian one is still operating. That's Trinity Episcopal, runs some great music events for the secular leaning. And uh, uh, St. Alphonsus actually is kind of a community center. So they also host music events and film screenings and stuff. Something to keep an eye out for. The antique shops and uh, and boutiques and so on along here. So we are in the fourth one, the fourth market stretch, and they pooled resources to install a selfie opportunity on this block. These people may sell antiques, but they are themselves adaptable to the times. So they commissioned this, and now folks come and visit the block just to take their picture. And I saw a photo shoot happening here earlier. So by way of those antiques, I mean, to me, the highlight, just down the way, La Belle Nouvelle Orléans, super cool place. But several other good ones here. <laughs> this, oh y'all, across the way, okay. You can just maybe make out some details here. This is the Great American Alligator Museum. And as the sign describes it, 
a 70 million year old a 70 million year old tale waiting to be told that sign and all that amazing window display sat there for years and years unopened and it was just a mystery I, uh, after watching them, that, seeing that display there for years, got online at one point and saw they had a GoFundMe, I believe, with this incredibly passionate explanation for why there should be an American Alligator Museum and all these prizes you could get. And I think they, they'd raised about 50 bucks from that. So, the tale waits to be uh, this place across the street is um, recently closed a uh, Persian rug store called Tale Blue. But formerly, you can see the building's real different, it was a movie theater and also ha took on uh, touring live shows. And we're talking quite some time ago. You can see, so the block, the side of the block that I'm on has these matching galleries all down it. And this side has virtually none. And that's because that movie theater used to have a marquee. And the owner of the movie theater managed to pay most of his neighbors to tear down their marquees, their, their, their galleries, so that his marquee would be more visible. Across the street, another great example of a modern version of what magazine has kind of always been about, Phanoi Viet, another great little Vietnamese restaurant, one of my favorites. And that is another immigrant-owned business where the family lives upstairs and they run the business downstairs. And it's also quirky in a fun way that ties in really nicely with Magazine Street in that the proprietor is also an antiques restorer. And when you look around in there, they have a clock face from St. Mary's, a whole giant clock on the wall. They have a framed letter from Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, that the guy found in a house. And they have all these Vietnamese comic books in the bathroom. The building across the way is our fourth and final market building. So everything we've seen is early 20th century construction. All the markets were rebuilt from having been these open air spaces with minimal covering. But this one, looks a little bit like the French market, so it kind of, even though it's, it's changed purpose a lot, it kind of declares what it used to be. And it is now an event venue, so when you see a crowd here, it is not groceries they're around for, but usually a wedding. Union Ramen that opened in the midst of quarantine, I think pretty early, and if I'm remembering right, and managed to do very well in spite of it. Lots of admiration. Got Grigri at the end of the block, a, another kind of classy modern Creole place, and on the right, the last of our Vietnamese establishments on the stretch we're going to walk, Lily's, is a lot of people's favorite. Lily herself is a real charismatic character, and they run both the nail shop next door and the restaurant. <laughs> and next to it we have the cat practice, which if I just kept walking this way, you would miss out on something pretty great. Which is their mural. The sun is tough to see through, but I hope you can make out this strange giant cat. It looks like soft serve ice cream. <laughs> Speaking of striking visuals, this 
not only one of the most brightly colored little things, but strange footprint too. You can see it is wedged in between other buildings. And that is because, as I'm passing along a granite road, Felicity Street runs with this for quite a ways. This is used to used to be what Magazine Street looked like in general. This or wooden blocks was what the whole street was paved with. So this guy, Flores today, is built at a spot where the streets bend. You can see that turn in the street right up ahead. Magazine is one of the many long streets through the city that follows the motion of the Mississippi. So the street is river shaped. So you get these little bends and they tend to fall right around the property lines between plantations. So as you may know, much of New Orleans, pretty much everything except for the French Quarter, was plantations at one point. And they ran from the riverfront in long, narrow strips back away from the river. So we are walking through the short dimension of those plantations right now, which means we've passed through quite a few in the course of this walk. The footprint landwise was usually pretty narrow, wealth determined how wide of a land strip you were able to have because the real premium was on riverfront land, or waterfront land, anyway. Another of what we've seen earlier. This is St. Vincent's Orphan Asylum. Okay, before we get there, second line. Just over that way a little bit is second line stages which is the local soundstage facility. And that is where lots and lots of movies and TV shows, a lot of times the stuff you wouldn't necessarily know was shot in New Orleans, was shot. Soundstage facilities can turn into anything. So if you want to get a great tattoo while you're here, eye candy is where it's at. That is not a stumble in drunk and get a Fleur de Lis tattooed on your calf kind of place. That is a premeditation kind of place. So St. Vincent's, this is an orphanage, formerly. Operated as such for about a century, starting right after the Civil War, or late in the Civil War, really. The Civil War was a great orphaner. So many deaths from disease during that time, way outnumbering the deaths from violence. Lots of children left fatherless, and fatherlessness could mean being an orphan back then, because it was very hard for a mother to make a solo living. So many surviving mothers gave their children up for adoption. Mojo, another excellent coffee destination with a cool courtyard. So. This was not only remarkable for just kind of symbolizing what was terrible about the years following the war, all the shambles that the war left the place in, but also it was founded with money from hard as it was to make a living as a single woman. It was given by a woman who did. This woman, Margaret Hawkery, who I like coughed in the middle of that. <laughs> We just call her Margaret. So there's a monument to her down towards the end of these streets. And Margaret was a woman who would have had a lot of room to sympathize with those women who lost their families during the war. Not only after immigrating from Ireland did she lose her husband, but she also lost children, ended up completely alone. And desolate as that left her, she started a bakery, 
just went around selling bread, selling milk. Was a more or less street vendor who eventually managed to parlay that business into a sort of massive bread empire and gave lots of free bread to children and poor folks alike, gave away half loaves so there was no value to them except as food. And eventually was extremely wealthy in her own right and ended up endowing lots and lots of charitable efforts across the city, including St. Vincent's back there. And after it stopped being an orphanage, it became a guest house. So people have been staying there for some years. It is closed as part of a renovation process right now. And while it was a, a kind of <laughs> come as you are and find it as it is sort of place, it's going to be pretty high end after the renovation is done. The other Surrey's location. And this is our other language immersion school, International School of Louisiana, which French, Spanish, and Mandarin, I believe, is their menu. We are surrounded right now, beautifully surrounded by 19th century, largely speculation houses. So the way that this all stands out from the Garden District is that you're looking on rows of close to identical, if not completely identical, buildings. So these were financial speculations by builders who would get a big chunk of land, build out the same plan over and over again. <laughs> Guess which house is not an example of that story. And they would usually turn a pretty good profit off of it. Leaves us with a very classical, but slightly more uniform style through here. But this is a really beautiful and representative section of the Lower Garden District for a walk. And the other one would be if you went a few blocks left of where I am right now, going along Coliseum Square Park, which has some beautiful houses little older on average and a little bit more individual. So this is the feel of like residential magazine street. We're not totally past businesses, but they're thinly spaced all through here. And while once in a while visitors will walk up to here because we are getting closer and closer to the French Quarter. It's often a part that you skip. Very interesting. I have not seen that before. So, if you've got it in you, I mean, by all means, I'm here to do these walks for you so that you don't have to walk four to six miles. But if you want to really immerse yourself. This is a section not to miss, I would say. say it doesn't have a share of modernization going on. The streets we're passing through, I don't know if y'all have been taking note of the street signs, but fun little story about them. What we got right here, Thalia. So there are eight streets through here named after eight of the nine muses in Greek mythology. The guy who first laid out this neighborhood, who was basically hired for the task of turning these plantations into 
residential developments. He was a very classically minded guy, and he laid out a really ambitious kind of suburb and gave it all these beautiful, ambitious names. It was Coliseum Street and uh, Britannia Street, named after, as we mentioned in our Garden District tour, the City Hall of Ancient Athens. Race Street for a racetrack that was going to be there. Coliseum Street after a Coliseum that was going to be there. None of those things ever got built. But also named these streets for the Muses, evoking this Greco-Roman classical atmosphere. And at one time, people would have gotten those references because the classics were a part of an education, back when education was pretty restricted. But our priorities have shifted, and nowadays we can correctly say Thalia and Errato, which is the one up ahead of us, but otherwise our pronunciation has really flagged on these things. The next one after that is Calliope, which we pronounce Calliope. Terpsichore tends to be Terpsichore. Melpomene is pronounced Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. And Clio or Clio tends to get said CL10. The original French truck location, tiny, charming little place. Barrel proof across the street, bar with food. Some great options there if you really want to pregame for this walk, should you do it in the opposite direction. And up ahead, you can see a highway overpass, that's the Pontchartrain Expressway leading across the Mississippi River. And beyond it, you can see a element of the World War II Museum. So we are approaching, in a very big sense, the area we would consider downtown. Used to be that Canal Street at the edge of the French Quarter was really the downtown divider, but you know, you build a, an overpass this big, and this is gonna become the dividing line. It's got the World War II Museum right on the other side of it. It's got the Ogden Museum of Southern Art and lots and lots more stuff. That is a tour unto itself. And beyond it lies the French Quarter. We haven't made that, uh, that tour of the business district, which uh, we'll probably call the American sector, the classic old name for it, when we get around to doing that. So watch for that to come out one of these days. And you can certainly visit our French Quarter tour for now. And if you get into our Katrina tour, you would learn about these highway overpasses and all of the ramifications they have had and the way that they replaced canals that used to run through spaces like this. So, pending that other video coming along, y'all, watch this one again. No kidding. Uh, watch some of the other ones, visit some of our other cities, Give us the benefit of a like and a subscribe. Hit the bell if you would like to know when that next thing comes along. Visit the American sector with us. Tip your guide down below. And think back fondly on Magazine Street until you can be here with us in person. Thanks for watching.